Um, so normally I spend the first bit of the presentation convincing everybody why we need to um, you know, talk about archaeology and nationalism and the politics of the past. And I'm so happy that that's finally a given and we can just move on from there. Sorry, my notes from a previous version I used this presentation for just appeared out of nowhere and I got very distracted for a second. Um, so very briefly, Romania in Eastern Europe is a really important um, context in which to have this conversation. And as we can see, it's been playing out in a number of ways, in a number of contexts globally, um, you know, for the past really 150 years. Uh, we talked a bit yesterday about how, um, you know, archaeology and uh, the study of the past was created specifically in a way to support nationalism, to support identity creation. So it should come to no surprise that it's doing exactly what it was designed for. I think this is from um, the plenary uh, panel. Um, but why should we talk about this uh, in the context of Romania? Uh, Romania is obviously a nation state in uh, southeastern Europe, and it has been described as a, a Latin island in a Slavic sea. It has the name Romania, which despite um, popular opinion has nothing to do with the Roma, is in fact named after a perceived link to the Roman Empire and to the Romans, um, which stands you know, directly in opposition to all of its neighboring states, which derive their origin myths rather from the Slavs or for, um, from people like the Bulgars or the Magyars um, instead of this Latin people who are still apparently exist in this one corner of southeastern Europe. So yeah, it's important to consider, um, perhaps I should go back to the previous map, uh, where Romania exists spatially, this territory, this region, uh, this landscape has acted as something as a bridge or a crossroads between the East and the West uh, for centuries, if you want to talk about it in, that, in those terms. Um, in a second, I'll talk about the number of different peoples who came through this region, but peoples who've had no, um, or given no voice in kind of the origin myths that have come up for the Romanian nation state. So basically the point being, Romania is spoiled for choice, but instead they've homed in on the Romans and the local indigenous people called the Dacians. And I kind of want to talk about briefly why I think that is and the ongoing consequences of it. So yeah, as I said, uh, the region of modern Romania has had a complex and diverse past, but the Romanian national narrative focuses one specific moment, and that's the foundation of the province of Dacia. Uh, you can see the outline of uh, Romania kind of overlaying Dacia just there. And Dacia was only held, it has the uh, dubious honor of being the last Roman province to be founded in 105 and the first to fall. 275, uh, which is up for debate, but those are the dates I like to go with, nice and simple. Um, so this territory, there's a lot more that happened in this territory, in this landscape, than these 200 years <coughs> the Romans were around. Um, it was various, at various times, it was, you could say it was controlled by the Romans, the Byzantines, Bulgarians, the Ottomans, the Wallachians, and the Romanians. Um, influenced by, I kind of break these out because you could also say that these peoples invaded this region, but, you know, splitting hairs at this point. We've got the Gedi, the Thracians, the Scythians, the Greeks, the Sarmatians, the Dacians, the Cumans, the Pechenegs, the Kievan Rus, the Turks, the Arabs, the Ruthenians, the Italians, and the Germans. Um, and in terms of evasion, I should probably, pro uh, you know, problematize that language a bit more. They're commonly known as having invaded, but really they just moved through. It's hard to say, and in, in moving through, it's hard to say how long they stayed, what they did, who they were with, because in archaeological terms, um, the early medieval period in this region is very much of a gray area. Um, so we've got the Visigoths, the Slavs, the Bulgars, the Aviars, the Magyars, the Pechenegs, the Tartars, the, the Golden Horde, the Mongols, uh, the Cossacks, the Russians, the Bulgarians. So in honing on, on this very specific moment, uh, Romania has created a really powerful narrative but when you, st and it's, it was so powerful in that it has kind of, um, well, it has massively impacted all the work that's been done since. And I think directly contributes to why I really don't know that much about the early medieval period, because that period has never really been seen as something that, you know, scholars really wanted to devote their time and energy into looking into when you had the Roman period or the classical period to look at instead. 
Uh, so there are three main myths of origin, and these myths of origin, which we've talked about myths a lot in this session, uh, change depending on who's in power and who's um, controlling the country politically. Originally, the myth of Roman origins comes from about the fifth, late 15th, early 16th century. It really gains the most power uh, towards the beginning of the 19th, mid-19th century. Um, and it's the idea that the Romanians are directly descended from the Romans who conquered Dacia. Never mind the early medieval period, never mind all this movement through this territory, we're going back to this very specific moment and saying this is where we came from. Um, and that was really popular when Romania was trying to build this connection in with Europe because it gave them a common ancestor. It said never mind the centuries we've had of you know, various people controlling us like the Ottomans who are firmly seen as belonging to the East. Actually, we're one of you, we belong with Europe, we belong with the West, and please won't you help us um, forge our fledgling uh, nation state. It's about the mid-19th century then. Um, and after Romania gains independence, um, which is a long and drawn out process, it's too long to talk about in 10 minutes, but they begin shifting, and you start hearing more, of I'm skipping to the bottom, uh, the myth of Romanization, which is the idea that perhaps the Dacians, these are the local Iron Age people who lived in kind of central Transylvania, uh, perhaps the Dacians can contribute, contribute as well, uh, will be the direct descendants of the Daca Romans, who are people who is both Roman and Dacian. Uh, they have the Roman civilization and the Dacian tendency to fiercely resist occupation, which is a really great combination if you can, you know, pick your ancestors. Um, and this was really popular up through uh, about the interwar period. And then we see a shift, and a shift towards the myth of ind indigenous origins, the idea that never mind the Romans were the descendants of the Dacians only. And this was really popular um, uh, during, oh, sorry. <coughs> during the communist era, particularly because it allowed them to create this uh, narrative of exceptionalism and to distinguish themselves that, yes, we're kind of a nationalist communist, oh boy, uh, we're a nationalist communist people. Um, you know, we claim that we're, you know, part of Europe as well, but we're not going to allow the Romans to contribute to our identity anymore because we want to be unique. And Ceausescu declared himself the direct descendant, I believe, of Burbista, and celebrated like the 2000th year uh, anniversary of the foundation of the Romanian state, I think in like 1987. Um, so things like that, a lot of things like that happened during that period. Uh, so just going back really quickly, why the Romans? Well, they give them a link to this common past of Western Europe, the veneer of civilization, aid from other Western powers, and this glorious past drawn to kind of make up for the present La relative lack of progress um, in Romania in the late um, 17th, 18th, 19th century. So I'm just going to skip this bit and go straight into the big point <coughs> I want to make. Um, but very briefly, the current kind of consensus is that uh, there's a DACA Roman continuity thesis and kind of settled upon that, okay, we're descended from both the Dacians and the Romans. It's very popular. It impacts all of the archaeological work being done by, you know, Romanians, foreigners, whoever. There are all these kind of micro supports for it embedded in the language and the discipline everywhere. Uh, so we've been talking about, uh, you know, the situation we're in and what we ought to do about it. And a lot of really good papers have come out <coughs> recently addressing this. And the point of my recently finished PhD thesis. Um, we're kind of engaging with these questions, and I used Romania as kind of the context to draw them out. And I wanted to know, you know, really how, given what we're in, how can we produce research which is liberated to explore new and progressive alternatives? How can we research the past in a way that challenges the political status quo and inspires positive change? And how can we best become political actors? Because I think that's a given, that's something we need to do. It is up for the d debate, um, particularly in the EJA, but I've come to the point where I think this is you know, the direction we need to head. Uh, so I came up with something called the post-national critique, drawing similar to what uh, Jonathan talked about earlier, and I honed in on the landscape um, as a way to really do this. And I said, okay, we need to recognize that methodological nationalism has had a massive impact on the way we view the past, the way we understand the past, because we're assuming that the nation state is a natural thing. And that lens is just kind of everywhere when you start looking. Um, so I went into the Romanian history <coughs> and a bit with British history as well, and I started trying to see all the places where assumptions has, had been made about the past because of methodological nationalism. Um, and then I then created this whole new narrative for Romania <coughs> specifically to highlight what I found post-national themes instead. So I went back and I looked at all the existing work and I 
figure out things like longevity in the landscape. The fact that this landscape had been there the entire time, had been impacted upon by so many different peoples, peoples who aren't recognized at all within the current national narrative. Um, and I use it as kind of a vision of understanding how, our, how our perception of identities, how strict categories of ethnic identities might change if we can critique the assumptions they're built upon, critique that assumption of methodological nationalism. My last slide, I promise. Um, so I find that we kind of are shying away from building these big narratives because there was no big narratives are really easily co-opted. Um, and I think we, Tags talked about that a lot yesterday in the sessions I was in. And I was kind of on the fence about it. And then I read this book uh, by Jill Laporte, who's a historian, I believe, from Harvard. And she said that actually the only way to really fight mainstream populism and nationalism, we have to engage in better storytelling, um, writing that when serious historians abandon the study of the nation, when scholars stop trying to write a common history for people, nationalism doesn't die. Instead, it eats liberalism. I think the point being, if we're not telling these narratives and telling these stories, then we're leaving the space for the kind of pseudo work that's going to fill in the gap. Um, so I find that post-nationalism and focusing on kind of overturning the assumptions of nationalism might be a way to take this forward. But we'll see. Thank you.